Chapter 24, Trauma Overview. Trauma or traumatic injuries or traumatic emergencies occur as a result of physical forces being applied upon the body. During a traumatic injury, we need to also take into account the possibility of medical emergencies that occur because of the injury or that may have precipitated the injury. We use the term index of suspicion or our awareness for potential serious or unserious. This helps us identify potential injuries that may happen that we cannot see. In all trauma, the body is insulted beyond what it's able to take care of. We also look at the mechanism of injury or the forces that are acting upon the body that could cause the injury or trauma. One of the biggest things is the concept of energy. We divide it into three things, potential energy, kinetic energy, and the energy of work. Work is the force acting or moving over a distance, if you think about a physics class, and all forces bend, pull, or compress tissues beyond their inherent limits, and as a result, injury occurs. We measure kinetic energy this way, Kinetic energy equals one half the mass times velocity squared. Why is this important? Well, think about the potential kinetic energy in a motor vehicle collision. If the vehicle weighs uh, one ton, then half of that weight times how fast the vehicle was going gives us our potential kinetic energy. Also, our potential energy is the product of mass and the force of gravity and how high or the height if somebody fell or something fell. Blunt force trauma is just what it says. Something that was blunt, hit, or came in contact with the human being. It causes injury without penetrating the soft tissue. Whereas penetrating trauma pokes through the skin, pierces or penetrates the surface of the body and significantly can cause more damage based on that penetrating trauma. In blunt trauma, an object making contact with the body can cause a bruise, can cause bleeding underneath the skin. We have to think about the structures that are underneath, the structures, the organs, etc., and what potential damage and injury that they may have been subjected to. Some examples are motor vehicle collisions, falls. They're the most common causes of blood force trauma. Skin discoloration is a good sign. So again, always be aware of what we might see or what we can't see. In vehicle crashes, the crash consists of three collisions. As you see in the picture here, the car, first of all, hits the object. So we look at the vehicle, gives us an idea whether it was a significant amount of speed, remembering our kinetic energy, one half mass times velocity squared, gives us an idea of the energy that could be transferred to our patient. Inside the vehicle crash, the passenger hits the interior of the vehicle. Notice here, the airbag is deployed, but the seat is broken. Was that broken by the rescuers removing the patient from the vehicle, or was that as a result of the crash? See significant intrusion into the engine compartment, 
All of that is transferred then to the patient. The third crash is the internal organs or solid structures slamming against the inside of the human being. Oftentimes, these can result in life-threatening injuries. As we look at different crashes, we see different types of injuries. In a frontal crash, or often referred to as a head-on collision, we determine where the passenger is sitting, whether they were restrained, airbags were deployed, how fast the vehicle was going. And even though they may have had all these safety devices in place, we need to suspect injuries to the extremities and internal. Did the airbag not deploy? Notice here in this picture, the seatbelts mark along the person's chest and abdomen. It was clearly wearing a seatbelt. It did its job. Now what kind of injuries are possible underneath where the seatbelt hit the patient? In a rear end collision, one of the most common types of injuries is what we refer to as whiplash or hyperflexion and extension of the cervical spine. We also have lateral side impact injuries and depending on where we are in the vehicle, gravity and centripetal force play a large role in the injuries that are sustained by the patient. Lateral chest and abdomen injuries on the side of the impact are possible. Possible fractures to the hip, lower extremities, and the ribs. And of course, the organ damage from the third collision. Rollover and rotational crashes clearly are by far some of the most serious. As you can imagine, the patient is bounced around inside of the vehicle. Injuries depend on whether the passenger was restrained or not. Ejection or partial ejection is often the most common a result of life-threatening injuries. And is the vehicle striking another vehicle or a solid object when it comes to rest? Car versus pedestrian injuries, again, very serious. Um, perhaps we don't see uh, exactly how injured the person is, uh, how fast was the vehicle going when they got hit. Typically, there is an up and over. Uh, adults have a tendency to go up and over the car, whereas pediatric patients go down and under the vehicle. Car versus bicycle. We evaluate much like a car pedestrian crash. How fast was the patient going? How fast was the vehicle going? Where were they at? Where were they struck? Was the person wearing a helmet or not? Is there a need for spinal mobilization? Motorcycle injuries or car versus motorcycle injuries can also be very serious. Was the patient wearing a helmet? Were they protected with leather or anti-abrasion garments, boots, etc.? It's always fun to see guys riding their motorcycles in the summertime. Now, I ride a motorcycle. I understand how freeing it can feel to ride that. But really, is it a good idea to wear a motorcycle in shorts and flip-flops and a tank top? The ground is very hard, very, very unforgiving. So some things you want to consider, too, is how fast were they going? What was the distance of the skid marks? What type of roadway surface did they, did they land on? Head on crashes with motorcycles. The patient go up and over the uh, handlebars, landing into the other vehicle, slamming into the ground. Um, often one of the common fractures that you will see of an up and over is an open book pelvic fracture as the rider is catapulted over the vehicle and landing on the hard surface and fracturing their pelvis. Ejection is common in um, motorcycle crashes, but isn't necessarily guaranteed all the time. And did they drag behind the bike? Did they get stuck on it? The various other things happen.
injuries from height, as it says here, anything more than 20 feet or six meters and is considered a significant fall. So no matter how tall we are, 20 feet is can be dangerous and significant. When I was in my early 20s, I was working on a construction site and I fell 21 feet off a ladder. Um, it's interesting how much time you have to think as you're um, falling in the seconds that it takes. Um, fortunately, I did not sustain any significant injuries as a result of that. Um, I was lucky. But internal injuries are possible. What did the person fall on? I've had patients who've fallen from height off of scaffolding and ladders and such. Uh, one person fell into a, a nice, soft, freshly tilled uh, garden spot and sustained minor injuries, um, abrasions from the ladder hitting her. Another person fell onto a, a pile of debris on a construction site and had several small um, penetrating traumas from nails and a broken glass and such. So different things we need to think about in, uh, in injuries from. In this illustration, we see a very common uh, fall that can happen there. The calcaneus, uh, the heel bone there um, can be broken. Um, that is almost certainly an 80 to 90% debilitating injury for that person. Um, and then that energy is also transferred up through the femur into the pelvis, um, subsequently through the rest of the spine and can cause many other injuries that would cause problems. As you look at this picture, this is truly a, a good example of penetrating trauma. Notice a knife buried to the hilt in the person's uh, chest. Um, of course, if there's any penetrating trauma and the object is still there, we don't want to remove it. We want to uh, dress around it, stabilize as best we can, and take that patient to the hospital, of course. Um, sometimes it's accidental. Purpose. Typically, they're low there's low energy penetration, such as knives, sharp objects, shivs, ice picks, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's projectiles that are uh, medium to high velocity, such as bullets, um, arrows, and other things uh, that could penetrate our body. So as we look at um, the injury, uh, thinking about the bullet as it goes in, perhaps it hits a, a flat spot on a bone, um, then it's going to ricochet or yaw off into another direction. So we need to uh, be cognizant of the potential path uh, that that uh, projectile might take within a person and then some uh, rounds are designed to fragment when they go in to increase the amount of damage uh, to a person so the the projectile goes in and then uh, fragment and then we have many many other injuries notice in this illustration here the high velocity weapon the uh, projectile enters the skin it goes in it creates a temporary cavity the bullet projectile can tumble as it goes through causing damage on the way in some of the uh, projectiles will mushroom and, or as we said, will also fragment, causing more damage. So don't get uh, tunnel vision into that you find an entrance wound, the exit wound is um, exactly opposite of that. There may be multiple exit wounds um, or there may be one larger exit wound. Sometimes the relationship between the distance um, and the severity of the injury varies depending on what type of weapon was used. Uh, was it a knife and it was drugged slowly across the person? Um, or was the projectile, uh, did it graze a person's arm or leg or head or whatever it might have hit? Um, and thereby allowing energy to be absorbed as the projectile doesn't quite go into uh, the person. Some uh, things you can look at, uh, some recognizable uh, symptoms or signs for different significant injuries. Um, you can take a look at this at your leisure. With blast injuries, um, there's always uh, an epicenter 
um, of the injury. So we refer to that as the primary or entirely in the blast zone. Then we have secondary uh, damage from being struck by flying objects, um, shrapnel, etc. And then tertiary, a victim that's hurled by the force of the explosion. Uh, perhaps they don't get any of the uh, shrapnel or projectiles that may have come out of the um, um, explosive, but they receive um, injury because of the concussive forces. <clears throat> then we have the, uh, the miscellaneous blast injuries, burns from hot gases, fires uh, started by the blast, etc. Uh, respiratory inhalation of toxic gases, a uh, crush injury that happens as a result of uh, collapsing a, uh, a building on top of a person, et cetera, um, different kinds of things. Uh, commonly uh, seen in, of course, combat zones, uh, IEDs, IEDs, um, where they're designed uh, to blow up when people step on them. Um, depending on the organ, it kind of depends on how it is affected. The uh, organs that are susceptible to uh, pressure changes are the middle ear. Uh, that's where our balance and um, receptors are located. And so that would cause uh, concussive injury would cause middle ear or uh, balance issues, um, uh, clearly some uh, auditory problems. The lungs. Uh, obviously being filled with air, um, and then an explosion, blast injury, concussive injury could uh, cause a, um, a lung to have a type of pneumothoracy. And then the same with the intestinal tract, it could rupture as a result of that. In our lungs, we have a, a short range exposure to the detonation pulmonary blast and arterial embolism could produce as it gets in ruptures the airways ruptures the vessels um, we could see visual disturbances remember our, our eyeballs are filled with fluid which will be affected by this um, all of this then in turn um, can cause behavioral changes solid organs are relatively protected from shock waves but remember um, what about the secondary missiles or projectiles or things that are hurled at the body? Uh, they can become sub. Uh, they can become subject to those injuries. Neurological neurologic injuries, such as uh, head uh, caused by head trauma, are the most common causes of death. And then traumatic amputations are, of course, common with blast injuries. Multi-system trauma, as we mentioned, this is where one or more systems of the body is involved. Um, and so we have to take the most life-threatening first as we take care of that. Um, here are some of the examples of uh, multi-system or more than one body system that could be uh, involved. It's always best to note, uh, uh, alert medical control whenever possible and we will always alert medical control but that we have a multi-system trauma and then make sure that we transport our patient to the appropriate facility. So for example, in Kitsap County, if we truly have a severe multi-system trauma, perhaps we're thinking about uh, uh, flying that person to Harborview Medical Center or maybe even ground transporting them to one of the trauma centers in Seattle. We have the golden principles of trauma care. We've talked about this in the past about um, you know, not just the golden hour, but what are the most important things on every scene? Of course, our safety, the safety of the crew, and the safety of the patient. Remember, in a, especially if the, the um, thing that caused a traumatic injury has not been mitigated yet, we wanna make sure that it doesn't become a problem to us. Do we need additional people? Do we need special equipment? Um, are we looking at building collapse, et cetera? Identify our ABCs, maintain shock therapy. Remember to cover the patient up. Cold people don't clot. This is very important. Is spinal mobilization necessary? All different things that we can be thinking about.
determine our MOI. Are they in critical? Do we need to rapidly perform a physical examination? Um, which we will do. We'll do a rapid trauma assessment. And then we'll look at the types of uh, MOIs uh, versus the chief complaints of the patient and see how they. Injuries to the head, uh, oftentimes there are unseen uh, brain injuries that might occur. So be aware that um, certain types of injuries can cause uh, head injury. And we'll have another lecture that we'll talk about head and neck and uh, spine trauma. Bleeding or swelling inside the skull is often the most life-threatening thing. Remember, there's only so much room inside of that package. And um, when it starts to swell, the brain has to go somewhere. So what we want to do then is make sure that we're doing frequent exams and checking the patient's neurological function. Injuries to the chest, remember they can be life-threatening because in our chest area, our mediastinum, that's where all the organs and vessels are that help to keep us alive, so such as our heart, lungs, and other vessels. So broken ribs might hinder our breathing. It could uh, puncture the lung. They could cause damage there. The heart can be bruised. We've talked about this uh, in the past uh, with the pericardial tamponade. Um, uh, contusions to the heart, to the lungs, and other large vessels may be torn or uh, ruptured. Um, one type of injury that happens sometimes in head-on collisions um, is the aorta can be separated from the heart. Um, so, and then of course pneumothorax and open uh, wounds to the chest. In the abdomen, we contain other vital organs that require um, high amount of blood, uh, for example, the liver, the spleen, the pancreas, um, all of these are filled with blood. The organs can tear, lacerate, or fracture, and that blood leaks out and can become uh, very uncomfortable for the patient. The hollow organs rupture, they leak their toxic digestive chemicals into our body systems. Remember, we are filled, our stomach is filled with acid, and our bodies like to live in a basic um, state at 7.35 to 7.45 on our pH. So any of uh, this material leaking into the abdominal cavity can, can be dangerous and cause some uh, some uh, bad things to happen. So our management, of course, starts with our scene time. We want to limit it to no more than 10 minutes. Select the appropriate type of transport. Um, if we're staffed by EMTs or paramedics or an EMT and a paramedic, perhaps going to a trauma center, if one is within a reasonable distance, then we would do that. Uh, perhaps it is uh, contacting uh, air medical transport. Uh, know the areas, uh, the capabilities of the hospitals in the areas where you are going to be. Um, hospitals are designated into the following four categories, uh, level one facility, has every aspect of trauma, including teaching, uh, neurosurgeons on staff 24 hours a day, surgeons on staff 24 hours a day. They can take care of just about anything that walks in the door. Harborview Medical Center in Washington State is the only level one trauma center um, that fits that description. Um, there are several uh, level two trauma centers, particularly in the Tacoma, Pierce County area. Um, St. Joe's and Tacoma General being uh, among the two uh, most common that we will be taking people to. Level three trauma centers that um, fully provides assessment, resuscitation, emergency care, stabilization. Harrison Hospital is a level 
three trauma center. Uh, I like to call them a level two and a half. I've seen them do some amazing stuff at Harrison Hospital in the emergency department that is beyond what I would consider the scope typically of a level two hospital, but that's my personal opinion. And then level four, that's your community hospital. They can provide advanced life support. Uh, Forks Memorial Hospital and Forks comes to mind or some of the other small community hospitals of level four. So the triage tool, um, I'll just leave it up here for a few seconds so you can look at it. Um, Depending on the system you work in, you may use this, you may not use this. Washington has one that's very similar to this. Um, so know the trauma uh, designations, trauma tools for your, your area. So like with all of our calls, we need to think about how we are going to be effective and how we are going to act. I'm just gonna tell you this. Trauma is visually stimulating. It is not normal to see things that are supposed to be inside of a person, outside of a person, or uh, limbs bent in directions that they're not supposed to go with joints that weren't there before uh, the injury happened. So, as it says in the first bullet point there, remain calm. Do an organized, systematic assessment. Start from the head, work to the foot. That way you don't miss anything. As you go along and you find something, stop and fix it. If it is life-threatening. The purpose of a rapid trauma assessment, and we will practice this, is to find and fix immediate life threats. Don't go all the way through and then go back. Stop the bleeding if we find it. Fix the airway problem if we find a problem, and so on and so on. Above all, do no harm. We will discuss the possibility of reducing fractures in the field and how we can do that. But if it hurts, then don't do it. And then never hesitate to call ALS if necessary.